Okay, great. Um, well, good morning or good afternoon, as the case may be, everyone. And thank you all for social distancing with us today. Um, my name is Chris Wilkes. I'm the Director of Strategic Accounts for the Custom Research Group at YouGov. Um, and I am joined today by Kristen Harmling, who is a Senior Vice President of Research with the Custom Research Group. We'd both like to welcome you to our webinar on corporate social responsibility and advocacy. Uh, I wanna thank all of you that joined promptly. Uh, we, we're gonna start in a couple minutes um, as we allow some last minute attendees to log in. But before we get started, I just wanna run through some basic housekeeping items for the webinar today. Uh, first of all, all, all of the attendees are set to mute to avoid any background noise, especially as I'm sure many of us are working from home at this point and juggling kids and homeschooling and pets and whatever the chaos we have under our belts while trying to work. Um, but we welcome any questions that you have throughout the webinar. Uh, if you look at the right hand side of your screen, we've enabled the questions panel where you can submit any questions you have throughout the presentation. Uh, we'll compile those and we'll be answering questions at the end of the presentation, but we encourage you to submit them as they come up throughout. Um, finally, we are recording the session. Um, so each of you will get a copy of the recording and a follow-up email uh, as well as some, some additional materials. Uh, so uh, without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. Um, this webinar is on corporate social responsibility and advocacy sponsored by YouGov. In case you're not familiar with YouGov, I'll get some of the requisite salesy stuff out of the way kind of quickly so we can get to the good stuff. Um, YouGov is a global research data and analytics company with over 30 offices in 20 countries. But at the core of our offering is really our panel of consumers. Um, we have over 8 million people who participate across 45 YouGov panels worldwide. Um, we collect data on a continuous basis from these panelists. So we have over 400,000 variables of opinions, attitudes, behaviors, perceptions from each of these panelists as we're constantly talking to them. Um, we've completed over 30 million surveys globally of these YouGov panelists. And that's one of the reasons that we are the number one quoted source of research in the UK, whether it is uh, consumer-based research or political type of research. Um, and, and that's also led us to some fantastic partnerships that you'll be seeing pop up constantly with the Democratic primary in full swing, uh, or as it kind of tails to an end, and the general election uh, with the Huffington Post, the CBS Battleground Tracker, the Economist, Yahoo, news, etc. Um, so with this amazing resource at our disposal, and as advocates and contributors in our own communities, uh, Chris and I conceived this idea of diving into corporate social responsibility late in 2019. Um, and so we conducted a 15 minute survey of 1,516 consumers, uh, really touching on uh, about 500 plus different data points. You know, we wanted to look into what issues consumers care about, you know, turning a special lens at times onto quote unquote advocates as consumers. And we'll talk more about what they are later. Uh, we want to understand how consumers live those values and advocate for their chosen causes um, and how that dovetails into what they expect from brands and companies. And we have some very relevant and even some new data to share here um, on ongoing sort of, uh, happenings. Um, we also want to look at how consumers' perceptions can be affected by CSR initiatives and what are some necessary ingredients and tips for successful advocacy initiatives. Why is all this important? Um, you know, whereas corporate social responsibility was sort of a nice to have in the past, it really is becoming more and more expected that brands are both aware of their impact on society and the environment, and they actually take steps to support social good. Uh, in our research, we found that 75% of the consumers we talked to felt that brands should be involved in supporting causes. Uh, and this isn't just a one-off data point. You know, companies are increasingly recognizing that this is what consumers expect of them. The Brands in Motion study that we do with WE Communications in eight markets around the globe found that 74% expect brands to take a stand on important issues. And a study by Cone Communications found seven in 10 Americans believe companies have an obligation to take actions to improve issues. Um, so everywhere you look, it, it's 70% plus that really feel that brands have a, a responsibility and obligation to be advancing social good. Um, and this expectation, if anything, has only been heightened and, and really focused by the emerging COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, as Kristen's going to highlight and dive deeper into later, we surveyed 1,000 consumers in the U.S. on Monday 
of this week. And we found that 86% feel that corporations and brands have a responsibility to take a leadership role and provide assistance to consumers as part of their response to the coronavirus COVID-19 pandemic. We're already seeing that play out with companies like Yum Brands promising to continue paying employees, even as they maybe switch to drive-through only models or broadband providers like Xfinity offering free service to low-income families during the crisis. So more and more, it's becoming an expectation for companies to step beyond just their bottom line. And consumers are literally putting their money where their mouth is when it comes to this and will back their expectations of companies up with action. Uh, in our research, we found that 51% of the consumers we talked to had previously boycotted or refused to purchase a product, a service, or a brand because of some social action they had taken or some cause they, they, they had taken that was not in alignment with the consumer's values. Um, conversely, 54% specifically chose to purchase a brand because their values did align. They saw that they were doing something that was important to them. Um, so yes, there, there's risk as well as reward, but the consumer expectation will only grow. It's, it's not going away. Um, so it's more important than ever not to go in blind. The CSR initiatives have to be based on, on insights into the consumer. You really need to have a foundational understanding of what's important to your consumers as you go forward. So the first thing we wanna do is start looking into what people care about. Um, so I'm gonna turn this over to Kristen and she's gonna to talk to us a little bit about what those issues are. Thank you all for joining us and thanks Chris for kicking us off. Um, if we look here, what we're looking at in this scatter plot is we're displaying the results of two of the initial questions we asked about respondents in the study. We first asked them, which of the following causes, if any, are you most passionate about? You can see that data in rank order in the purple with healthcare access on top, military and veteran support being second, and so on down the line. The second question that we asked, which you see here in the pink, um, with the pink label, is if advocacy can be defined as active engagement by an individual group, with an aim to influencing decisions with political, economic, and social institutions, do you consider yourself an advocate for any of the following causes? So we really wanted to make sure that we were giving people an anchor and a grounding when we were gonna ask them if they were advocates because advocate can mean a lot of things to a lot of different people. And you can see that generally speaking, we have between one third and one half of the percentage of people who are passionate saying that they're advocates. So it is a very tight group of individuals, um, but I don't want anybody to think that they are, um, you know, an extreme group of activists, because when we collectively look at this group of advocates together, we can see that in fact, um, they actually hit about 54% or 56% of the American population. So as we move through the presentation, when we show you how some of these data and how the expectations for corporate social responsibility play out, we'll oftentimes be looking at this group of advocates. So again, an advocate, as we've defined it here, is anyone who identifies themselves as an advocate on any one of the many issues that we presented to them in the survey. So who are the advocates? Well, they're higher income, they're higher education, and they are most certainly vocal. What they are not is they're not any older or younger, than the average um, age of the population. In terms of ethnicity, they're just slightly more diverse than the general population. I mentioned that for income, they are higher income. Um, the average income for all households in the nation is about 71 or 72,000. Among advocates, it's 79,000. Um, gender, there's a very small skew towards male uh, versus female, but again, it's, it's quite small, still looking at generally speaking a 50-50 split. I mentioned that they are more highly educated. 35% of them have obtained a four-year college degree or more compared to 28% of the adult population in the United States. And they are only slightly more um, likely to say that they are affiliated with the Democratic Party. Doesn't mean they're a registered Democrat. It's just a you know, which party do you more closely associate with? Uh, for our general population surveys, that's closer to about 34%. The top causes that advocates care about include healthcare access, addressing issues of poverty or hunger, military and veterans affair, 
health treatments, whether it's cancer research or Alzheimer's research, et cetera, and then issues related to the environment and sustainability. So there are many, many different ways that advocates can um, prove and, and display their passion and their belief in the cause. So we've rank ordered them here. These are the things that they take, the actions they do for the causes they care about. Right up on top is use social media to voice your support, sign a petition. Oftentimes those are one on the same. People are signing petitions through social media. 54% have said they've donated money. And then you can see there's a pretty big gap. We jumped down to 39% have volunteered their time and equal percent written or called state and local federal representatives to say something about the cause and so on down the list. We even have 13% of advocates saying that they have either held or ran for political office. Um, in most cases, we're talking about local offices and local boards. So in addition to doing all of these things as advocates, I'm going to jump back to some of the data that Chris uh, talked to you about earlier in the presentation. If you recall, with the slide where we had the, the balancing, it was about 50% saying in general, saying that they have boycotted or refused to purchase the product and about an equal number telling us that they specifically choose to purchase based on actions that companies take related to corporate social responsibility and different causes. We'll look at how these data play out among advocates. So advocates, not too surprisingly, are far more likely to say they're going to boycott or to say that they're going to purchase based on their values and attitudes. So now if we think about these, this is our more highly educated and higher income groups. They are typically, depending of course on your industry, the group that has um, greater purchasing power or take up a greater share of our sales and revenue. So they're not a group of people that can be ignored because they are more likely to put their money where their attitudes are. So it's not only about money and um, signing things online, we saw that there was a little bit of a dip between, you know, online petitions or, and donating money. We saw that only about 39% said they have time. So time is something that I, I feel safe in saying almost all of us kind of feel stretched for time. So majority of advocates and non-advocates wish that they could do more. It's 84% of advocates say they wish they had more time, as do even seven out of 10 non-advocates. All this signals ways that as corporations and brands, we can step in and fill that gap, whether it's the gap that people don't have enough time to make the contribution they want to take, whether they don't have enough money to make the contribution they want to make, or whether they just don't know how to affect the type of change that um, a larger voice through a corporation, through its employees, or through a combining of its customer group might be able to take. So again, the theme of this presentation is how can we as corporations step in and deliver not only on people's expectations of us, but of what they really want to be able to do in their own lives, perhaps through us. So let's dig a little bit more deeply into what their expectations are. Here's another scatter plot, and this one is sorted by the percent of respondents who say that companies and brands ought to be vocal on these specific issues. So when we think about national or global multinational companies and brands, that's in the pink. So sustainability, environmental issues is up at about 80% of consumers saying that brands and companies need to be vocal, they need to be doing something. And um, then you can see we've got a large sort of second tier grouping, things like animal treatment, poverty and hunger, ra hunger racial injustice, educational access for oppor and opportunity for children, and so on through the performing arts. All of those are between 60 and 70% of consumers saying that brands should be doing and saying something about their position on these issues. And at the bottom of the list, we see things that have traditionally been in the hands of policymakers and nonprofits. So things like education policy is contrasted to education access. Things like Second Amendment rights, religious freedom, and public broadcasting. And I want to talk now about the other pieces of data that are scattered here on this plot. It's the percent who say that local businesses should be vocal. In many cases, consumers expect both larger companies and brands as well as local businesses to take a stand. Look at how equal they are on things like racial justice and equality, 
gun control, and ending violence, education access and opportunities for children, women's rights, immigrants' rights, and education policy. These are things where it's a virtual um, equal percentage of people saying that national companies and brands as well as local businesses should be vocal and doing something. Um, but then others may be a little surprising. Maybe it's surprising that local businesses have uh, more people have expectations for local business than they do for um, national businesses. But when I think about it a little bit more, these are things that actually hinge on how people are treated in their daily lives. So if we look um, at the fifth one or the fifth one from the top, LGBTQ rights, that's actually more people expect local businesses to be vocal about that than even national business. Or something like economic fairness and equality, gender rights, educate, uh, military and veteran support. These are all things that really need to be executed on an interpersonal or a local level to make a true difference. So for most of you on this call, there's two avenues to take to meet consumer expectations. If you are local, if you have a local presence, act local. And if you don't have a local bricks and mortar presence, whether it's in the form of an office or a retail establishment or whatever the case is, form partnerships and overt relationships that community members are aware of with retailers, with local governments, with local nonprofits, so that your customers can see you acting locally and in concert with local businesses. That creates a win-win, or really even a win-win-win. Local business wins, major corporations win, and community members and consumers win. So Chris mentioned this large number that I've got on the left-hand side of the slide at the top of the presentation this afternoon. Uh, we know that 86% of consumers feel that corporations have a responsibility to take a leadership role in um, the COVID-19 crisis that we are currently facing. We went a little bit deeper and we asked them which, if any, of the following do you think corporations and companies should be doing as part of their response? 77% said provide paid sick leave to those who need it. 71% offer and implement work from home policies. And then we've got a couple of other specific items in here. And quite frankly, this list could have been 25 items long, but we wanted to try to hit upon some of the bigger ones, so offer delayed or suspended payments to existing customers at 55%, make a contribution to a local charity food bank, especially when it comes to students being out of school and so many students across the nation relying on their schools for not just lunch, but sometimes breakfast, lunch, and dinner. I like the one at the bottom that 42% say that they would like to see companies create communications and advertising that assure people that they are committed to keeping people employed and to keep the economy moving. Um, we recognize that not all businesses can do this. You know, Chris mentioned a couple of examples, uh, and I'm sure we've all been receiving emails in our um, inboxes from companies that we patronize as consumers. I have got one from El Alta and from West Elm. They let me know that their online business is open, sometimes with a discount, which is great. Um, and while they're closing their retail establishments for a while, they, they're paying their employees as if they were open. Um, it goes a long way for kind of building up that capital, that emotional capital that people have when they think about a brand. So yes, all companies cannot do this, um, but knowing that some are, it, it builds a sense of that these companies care about more than profits. They care about the social good. And I just wanted to mention and stress again that this is data that's literally two days old. We fielded this on Monday afternoon. We had results back on Tuesday morning through our YouGov direct service, um, which pulls people through an app that people have agreed to sign up for. Very quick turn, and we were able to get this data to share with you today. So, because let's face it, you know, I talked a lot about in the last slide how companies can build goodwill even during times of crisis and sometimes even more so in times of crisis. Um, the reality is, Consumers are pretty sour on a lot of things of day, these days, and they don't necessarily think that companies care about the social good. So this data is from our core study that we're sharing with you today. So it was collected in uh, the fall, late fall of 2019. What we can see here is that by and large, um, the top four companies are viewed as creating more problems than they solve by a margin of about three to one. So I'll walk you through some of that data. 
we can see up here at the top that 13% of consumers think the health insurance industry solves more problems than it creates, compared to almost three times that, as that many saying that the health insurance companies create more problems than it solves. All other industries, with the exception of technology, are viewed as creating and solving problems by about the same percentage of people. Again, these have been the numbers in the purple compared to the red. And generally speaking, um, it's like a two to one ratio. Um, oh, but that's technology, excuse me. The technology, as I mentioned, is the only industry where there are more people saying that it solves more problems than it creates, and that's by a two to one margin comparing that 33% to the 16%. There's another point on the scale that I want to draw your attention to before we move on from it, and it's the, what I call the do-nothing point, and that's over here down the vertical list on the left-hand side of your screen, right-hand side of your screen. So, um, you know, these are the 31% say that fashion is, is doing nothing. It's not creating. It's not solving. 31% say they're just standing by, and they're not doing much of anything. The same can be said for the food and beverage industry, one out of six. Same for retail at about one out of six. So if you're in one of those industries who are viewed as either sitting on the sidelines or who are doing more harm than good, and we're all there to some extent, you can see that from the red numbers on this slide, a good, solid, authentic corporate social responsibility can mitigate negative use of your industry. What we're going to move into now in this part of the webinar is we're gonna take some case studies. And again, this is all from the survey that Chris and I launched in the fall. I'm going to take you through a couple of examples. So we're going to look at Netflix. We're going to look at Wendy's, Starbucks, Wells Fargo, Tom's, and Patagonia. We'll go do a deeper dive on three of them. These are not brands that we're currently working with. We selected them based on wanting a variety of industries and knowing that each of them had initiatives that were well documented in the public domain. So any information you see about the initiative was pulled from the public domain. And some of the initiatives were more specific than others. So I'm going to put on the slide now what the percentage of people who were aware of the particular initiative we asked about was. So let me get this data up here. A couple of takeaways here. So the percentages that you're seeing on the top in the darker gray shadowed box, this is the percent of people who were aware of the brand and were also aware of the brand's initiative. And for NetSuite, for example, what we talked about there was that they give um, extended paid leave, 52 paid weeks of parental leave for birth and adoptive moms. So even among customers, only 13% were aware that Netflix did this. For Wendy's, we talked about the Dave Thomas Foundation for adoption. And among people who were aware of Wendy's, 49% were aware of that. And 50%, same number, of their customers were aware of this. So you can see across the board that with the exception of Tom's, even among customers of the brand, not even a majority were aware that the brand was doing what we had asked them about. So for me, that's the first takeaway, that awareness of corporate social responsibility is generally low. That simply means it's not working as hard for you as it could be. Let's jump in with Patagonia. So this is the initiative that we shared with people. So we didn't talk about Patagonia's overarching commitment to sustainability in the environment. Um, it's what they were founded on. They literally, it's in their DNA. The brand grew at the same time their commitment to corporate response to um, the environment grew. But we, what we did was we asked very specifically about their 2019 initiative where they donated two causes that take care of the environment and that are being impacted by climate change. They donated their full federal tax cut to those causes as a way to not only support what they believe in, but as a way to make a very vocal statement that they did not believe in the particular policy. So when people did not know about that initiative, and again, those numbers were quite low, we took a look at the recommendation, likelihood of recommendation, we use the standard of a zero to 10 point scale that you would use in NPS. The data that I'll show you is top three bucks. We said, you know, um, are you aware of the, and, and then any initiative that they do? They told us no, we showed them the initiative and we asked them once again, how likely would you be to recommend the brand to a friend or family member? 
So you can see some of the before numbers. If I can get my clicking to work. Okay, there we go. So we've got the before numbers. They're all pretty close together, whether we're talking about people who advocate specifically for environmentalism, if they are non-advocates, don't advocate for anything, or if they're advocates but not for environmentalism. So here's the before numbers. We share the initiative with them and look at the different lift that we got. So the lift is significantly greater for those who are advocates for environmental causes, as one might expect but they also got a significant lift from advocates of other causes and also 33% among non-advocates. We also look for each of the three brands I'll share with you today at the impact among customers and non-customers. Again, this is before, um, this is only among people who did not know about the brand's corporate social responsibility initiative. So we see it started out with 23% of customers were likely to recommend, 17% of non-customers were likely to recommend. We showed them um, a description of the initiative, and for customers, the lift went up to 42%. Um, I'm sorry, the recommendations grew up to 42%, and the lift is 81%. Among non-customers, it is even greater. Very similar trends when we talk about Starbucks. Starbucks' commitment to hiring veterans, to hiring young people, and to hiring refugees working with the UN. And we see the same patterns here. We see some baseline measures. Um, it is lower here for advocates, but maybe those who don't support or aren't advocating for veterans or immigrant rights. And kind of interesting that these are two um, very different kind of um, you know, causes that people might care about. And you can see the same patterns, highest among people who are connected to the cause personally, but also significant lift among advocates who advocate for other types of things and a slight lift among non-advocates. What did the lift look like among Starbucks customers and non-customers? Very similar patterns. Up 18% for customers, but up even more among non-customers. So the patterns that we see here really indicate that, you know, when someone's chosen to be a customer of yours, it, corporate social responsibility goes a long way to perhaps solidifying their loyalty, making them even more valuable customer, customers to you, but it can also be a way to bring new customers on board when a non-customer finds out that you stand for more than what they already know about you for your products and services. When they realize that there's more behind the company than they otherwise thought, more likely to recommend and perhaps even convert into being a customer. The last initiative that we'll share today is Wells Fargo. So this was all about Wells Fargo donating up to 2% of its after-tax profits to um, largely local food banks and disaster relief efforts, and also giving um, employees two days off a year to volunteer at the charity of their choice. So let's take a look at the before. Very, very cluttered, all right around the similar numbers, whether you're an advocate for poverty or hunger, or whether you're a non-advocate for any cause, or whether you are an advocate just not particularly for poverty or hunger and crisis services. And you can see the lift here for the different groups, about 85% for advocates um, as well, whether you are an advocate of hunger and poverty and crisis or not, and about a 40% lift for people who don't consider themselves advocates. Take a look at what happens with customers, non-customers. So customers were at 39% recommendation. Um, non-customers were at a very, very low 3%. And look at the lift. So Wells Fargo coming off their data breach scandal in 2017 and mortgage fraud scandal and settlement in 2019, it's the non-customers that experienced the greatest lift, 459%. Overall, yes, it's only 15% that are saying, oh, I would recommend the brand to a company or you know, to a friend or relative based on what I now know, but it's really the lift that is just simply tremendous. People did not know that Wells Fargo was involved in this kind of initiative. So when we think about how to execute 
on um, corporate social responsibility initiatives. Uh, a couple of things before we wrap up the presentation is that authenticity is imperative. 79% say they can't stand it when companies jump on the bandwagon of whatever causes they think customers care about. 88% say if a company is going to be involved in an issue that impacts society, the company's leaders need to truly believe in the particular cause. There is no question that today's consumers, even though we do still fall for fake news every once in a while, they can see through a company's BS, if you will. They know when a company is doing something just to make themselves look good versus when they're doing something that is authentic and comes from the heart of what the brand stands for. And we oftentimes think of corporate social responsibility in terms of, you know, what it, how will it impact my bottom line in terms of customers and sales and revenue and things of that nature. But it also matters to employees, too. 78% of the employed consumers who took our survey said it's important that the company they work for have a mission and a purpose beyond making profits. And they felt that this did impact companies' bottom line. They felt that com people who work in companies that have strong pro-social initiatives, 43% said that they felt those workers would be more positive about their work, take more pride in their work, defend the company's positions on things, work harder, and 30% felt like turnover would be less in a company that has a strong commitment to making the world a better place. So to take it home for everybody today, I've just presented a couple of conclusions based on the data that we talked about today. So consumers, high expectations for corporate responsibility. Corporate social responsibility initiatives can help mitigate negative industry views. Corporate social responsibility can do what people don't have the time, the money, or the know-how to do. But awareness of initiatives is often low even among customers. Lift in recommendation at least is highest among people who advocate for the same cause. So when your values are in sync with the brand that you're buying from, it makes perfect sense that um, you're going to be more moved by, if you will, when you find out the corporation is doing something good. But it also increases among advocates in general. The lift is higher among non-customers than customers in terms of likelihood to recommend. And CRS matters to employees as well. So before we open it up to question and answers, I'd like to leave you with a few thought starters. Um, based on the data, based on the work that we do with clients, based on our history in the industry, um, just a few ideas in terms of making sure that your corporate social responsibility initiative is, is as effective as it can be. Don't be shy. Corporate social responsibility initiatives are simply under leveraged if a majority of customers and prospects don't know about them. We do a lot of work here at YouGov in testing messaging for new products, for new advertising campaigns. We do pricing testing and all sorts of very tactical and important work when it comes to new products and new services, new bundles, et cetera. Um, but we recommend that people invest in a messaging strategy just like you all invest in messaging strategy for products and brands to help build a stronger connection between your brand's value proposition as people know it today and your corporate social responsibility initiatives so that when people think of one, they automatically think of another. Don't fake it. Better to be true to yourself than to chase consumer approval by committing to causes that are not true to your brand's heritage, that are not true to your brand's leadership or employees. Um, because much like Patagonia and Tom's, these brands live and act through their values. And any brand that really wants to have a successful initiative, it has to be a true embodiment of the policies, practices, and beliefs of the people that work for the company. In that vein, show more than tell. Um, I don't think anyone in this day and age should be afraid to showcase the impact of social efforts and remembering that a picture is worth a thousand words. Um, so it's great to say how much money has been given away, how many communities have been impacted, how many children have received books or free online access. All of that is great, um, but let people actually see it through intimate personal case stories, through pictures that people have been impacted or sending in. And it's easier than ever to do that kind of solicitation from people and get them to upload their own stories and images and videos. Um, put a face to your advocacy efforts so that people really do believe it's part of your DNA. 
make the social responsibility initiative more than an attribute. Um, the reality is, is it's harder and harder to differentiate in today's world based on product features and benefits. They are so easily replicated and there is so much competition on the, in the marketplace. So it, it's tough to say, I mean, nobody can really say I've got the best quality product, I've got the best this, the best that, because who believes that anyway? And tomorrow somebody else might be able to state claim to being the quote unquote best. So elevate the status of corporate social responsibility efforts in ways that complement the established elements of your brand proposition, whether it is quality, safety, et cetera. Um, to this end, you know, uh, measure, adjust, and measure again. I had mentioned, you know, we do so much work around concept testing. We don't do a ton of work about the impact and the receptiveness and the relevance of corporate social responsibility initiatives. So in an increasingly competitive world, where it's more difficult to get noticed with almost every day that passes because there's so much noise in the marketplace, whether it's news, whether it's other brand advertising, et cetera. Um, data is the key to understanding where you are in the mind of the consumer. So we're starting to recommend more and more that people include some advocacy language in their satisfaction or their brand landscape or brand tracker studies. In most of the brand studies that, that, that I've worked on here and my colleagues have worked on at YouGov, there's always seems to be one or two pro-social attribute, like the brand is committed to the greater good or the brand shares my values, but it tends to be one or two items in a list of 20 or more items that are feature heavy. So we're really encouraging our clients to kind of rethink their attribute batteries to get more at the heart of this idea of corporate social responsibility, given some of the stats that we shared with you at the top of the hour. So with that, I'm going to take us to our closing slide. And Chris and I are very happy to entertain any questions that you might have. Thanks, Kristen. Um, so we, we have a, a few questions from our audience, um, and I'll, I'll just start with the first one um, we received through the chat bar. Um, is this the time to be making offers? Um, the, the participant says, I hear about the need to talk about the social good, but the offer piece I wanted to confirm. Um, if by offer we mean offers for products and services, um, you know, I think people are very aware that, that most of us are in the business of making money, right? We're not nonprofits, and, and we can't put a hold on paying attention to the bottom line, even if we are 100% committed to the social good. So I think that people are okay having combined messages about um, this is our offer, this is what we're selling, and this is what our brand promises. And really the, the, the recommendation, if you will, is that, more of that brand promise include pro-social initiatives and what your brand stands for in that regard above and beyond the products and services that you're offering. So if that what was meant by offer, I hope that answers the question. Great. Um, we have a couple more. Um, do you believe that CSR should be conducted differently from one industry to another? The data you presented showed problems created versus problems mm -hmm. solved, but how does that translate to opportunity from one industry to another? Yeah, I mean, honestly, if we were giving, you know, tactical advice, we would want to unpack exactly why people feel like a particular industry is solving more problems than it creates or why they're creating more problems that they solve. So there's a, there's a lot to unpack in just that single slide um, on its own. So I, I think you've got to know that first, but I think there are some things that, that could be pretty obvious disconnects. Um, one of the brands, and, and we never like to, you know, highlight the, the negatives, but we didn't have time today to show you a couple of the other brands that we had in the study, but one of them was Lego. And Lego has on their website a really big commitment to environmental sustainability. And when we showed that to uh, people who were aware of Lego, they didn't experience a lift. And our hypothesis um, with the team at YouGov, with Chris and I and our colleagues, is that there was just too much of a disconnect, right? Here's someone who's a manufacturer of, of plastic toys, and they have so much value from an educational standpoint, from a STEM standpoint, from teaching kids to be creative and build things. But there might just be too big of a disconnect to expect consumers to be like, oh, yeah, okay, Lego's highly involved in efforts of sustainability. So we're not in any way suggesting that they shouldn't be doing those things, but maybe a better um, 
pro-social message to have highlighted was how they assist educating the world's children, how they put together curriculum and how they might offer it for free in uh, low, low or high poverty schools. So there has to be synergy between what you do and what you stand for, unless, of course, it has such an authentic connection, like Wendy's is an example that comes to mind. There's really no strong connection between making Wendy's hamburgers and Frosties and to adoption and foster care. But we all know that that was something that touched Dave Thomas's, the founder of Wendy's family, in so many different ways. So for him, while there's not really a business connection between his industry and the cause that he champions, there's a clear personal industry, which a personal connection, which, you know, who can shoot a bullet through that? You just can't. It, it is what it is because it's founded on his values. So hard to give a general answer to that, and I think that it does warrant digging deeper on an industry-by-industry industry basis and then also collecting the competitive context so you know where you sit vis-a-vis -vis other competitors in your industry. Yeah, if I can jump in for a second. When I think about um, the, the original thought behind this study and, and sort of what we were trying to get at, um, I think it really makes a case for doing research um, on a per brand basis to understand what is important to your customers and maybe even digging deeper into your segmentations or whatever to understand what might be most important to your loyal customers, which issues really resonate with them um, or looking at your competitors and seeing if there's opportunity to gain market share by supporting causes that you know for fact are important to customers in your industry that might be currently, um, you know, consumers of a competitor. Uh, so I don't think there's a one size fits all. Um, I, I think there's really a lot of value in starting to conduct this research with an eye towards getting into the mind of what your consumers values are outside of the, the products and features. I think, I think that's where everybody stays focused, but if you kind of get to their core values a little bit more, um, that's where I think you can start tailoring CSR initiatives and messaging and make them aware of it. Obviously that's the other key takeaway mm -hmm. is they have to know you're doing it or it, it really right. is, is not going to pay dividends for you in the same way. Um, so more, well, we have that, a lot more questions but, pop up now. <laughs> yeah, but I'd, I'd love to build on, on what you were just saying, Chris, because there is a question that came in on clarifying uh, the data that we shared among awareness of initiatives generally low. And the question is, is that because the company has a low level of awareness or if the CSR initiative is not well known? Um, those data were among people who were aware of the company. So it's not driven by um, lower or higher level of awareness. The data on this slide was specifically down-based, had a filter on it of people who were aware. And then the second number on that slide that showed the six companies was among customers. So um, it really does kind of drive home the point that, you know, wow, even among customers and awares, uh, very few, with the exception of um, Tom's, had awareness of over 50% of the initiative. Uh, we have uh, a couple more questions. Um, curious to know about the characteristics of extreme advocates. Are they similar to ordinary advocates in terms of buying mm -hmm. power, education level, ways to voice their support? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. And what I would want to do in that case is I wouldn't even want to look at our collective groups of, um, you know, the 56% of Americas that, that nets across all. What I'd really like to do is look at individual advocacy causes and see how people are different, whether they advocate for causes like poverty and inequality, or if they advocate for causes like LGBTQ rights or education. And then within that group, I think that's when we can really get a better understanding of what people who are um, ultra committed, if you will, to, to the cause. Um, so even something like joined a local board or ran for office, is that more likely to occur for people who want to fight for education or want to fight for environmentalism, et cetera? So we didn't make an overall extreme cut of advocate, but if any of you are on the phone or interested in a particular cause and what those advocates look like, um, we'd love to have that conversation with you. And um, there was another question that asked about differences between the more affluent respondents versus the general population. So we know that overall, the advocate group does skew um, more, does skew higher income than the regular. So we did stay and look at the data through that lens, not necessarily through the lens of overall income. 
Um, but I will tell you that um, I used to work on the survey of affluence and wealth, um, the affluent perspective here at YouGov. And overall, there's no question that the more affluent the consumer, the higher their expectations of companies. And that is going to apply whether we're talking quality of the product, um, you know, where the materials have been sourced from, the kind of customer service they, they expect, or um, the, the way the company contributes to the greater good. So overall, the affluent population is going to have higher expectations. And again, that's another, if someone is particularly interested in what a, a set of data points look like among the more affluent consumers, we certainly have the ability to look at the data that way. Um, I'm trying to see if there are any other questions. I don't see any other questions at the moment. Um, I think that's I just see, about it. Yep. I see one that's just asking if they'll be able to access the slides and data points afterwards. The answer is yes. That'll be available to you when we send you out the link to the recording. And um, it, it would nothing would delight us more than if you shared the recording with colleagues and, and shared the presentation deck, because um, this is kind of one of our ways of, of giving back to you all and sharing this kind of information with you. Excellent. Well, I think that's uh, just about going to wrap it up unless people have any, any final questions. Again, uh, we want to thank everybody for joining us. And as mentioned, we'll be sharing the recording and the slides in a follow-up email. But if you have uh, any other questions in the meantime, don't hesitate to reach out um, to either of the email addresses you see on the screen. And we look forward to connecting with all of you, um, hopefully in the future. Uh, well, there's a question. Is there, is there a tweet? I'm not sure. What I don't know the answer to that. <laughs> we'll, we'll check out with our marketing group and, and we'll see if, if we can make that happen. But and, we should definitely have some well materials. For, we'll have follow-up materials available for everyone who's on the call. And, and I'm sure that some of them will also be available via LinkedIn and, 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 and broader um, circulation soon. So thank you everybody for joining us. Thanks so much. Have a good day and stay safe.